Thank you. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the November 16th combined meeting of the Pine Richland School Board. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, Ms. Williams. Mr. Lyons. Present. Mrs. Misbach. Here. Mr. Kashani. Here. Dr. Campbell. Here. Mr. DiTulio. Here. Dr. Mihalik. Here. Dr. Meyer. Here. Mr. Moy. Here. Mrs. Swope. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. As has been our custom lately, we'd like to move right into the COVID-19 educational model update. Uh, tonight's update will also be provided to the community in a podcast. That's right. Dr. Miller. Okay, thank you. We'll just take a second here while we get the PowerPoint up. Okay, so again, thank you. Uh, this topic, as much as any topic in my career, is one that seems to evolve and change day by day, certainly week by week. And over the last eight months, we've seen incredible uh, understanding, learning, uh, and change with respect to what was the novel coronavirus and now known as COVID-19. So tonight, I'm going to provide an update around that's really important it's important for our community to understand i'm sure that we have a number of viewers this evening and uh, that includes not only students parents but also staff members okay next slide sean so tomorrow this will go out via podcast this portion of the um this portion of tonight's presentation and what i thought i would do is hit some key points almost like an executive summary so one of the challenges of providing comprehensive information to families is it takes a while to do that. So some of my updates are a little bit long. On the other hand, it's critical that we walk through all the specific details and rationale for thinking. So at a high level, uh, weekly e-blast started about a month ago. And on every Friday, we're able to share with our community the metrics that we're using for decision making. That also allows us to share on a weekly basis some of the key points of focus. Then, during board meetings, we have a more comprehensive update. With respect to our educational model, and I signaled this through our weekly update on Friday, we're at a place where we are giving notice of a recommendation to make a transition to 100% virtual for all. And I'm going to talk through that based upon the conditions and cases. So the conditions are worsening. The cases, specifically at Pine Richland, are increasing. And when we talk about cases, there are direct cases, which are cases directly involving Pine Richland students or staff, and then indirect impacts of cases. So for example, we might have a parent, a mom or a dad, who is COVID positive at, at, at home, not a part of our district, but they have two or three kids and those children are quarantined during the period of time that the parent might be positive. So we have direct and indirect cases. I'm gonna talk through very specifically what happens with case investigation. When we learn of a confirmed case, what are the next steps of the process? There's confusion and misunderstanding about what that looks like, so we wanna be very clear about what are we doing and how do we coordinate with the Allegheny County Health Department. The important part of what we've been talking about since the summer is our hybrid approach with the big three really provides strong mitigation. So when it comes to cases and case investigation, one of the greatest strengths that we have is the design of the hybrid that we have in place, and that makes a big difference. Health Services uh, has done an incredible job, and their job is to coordinate and communicate effectively and we've talked before about how to balance the level of concern with awareness, also with privacy. We are heading into a very distinct time. 
with respect to college, return of college age students to the home and also a couple of different holidays and breaks that bring with them uh, other risks of significant concern. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about uh, treatment and prevention. Next slide. <clears throat> Six weeks ago, given the conditions and the rare few cases that existed, we said in the upper right-hand corner of this slide, that V for the cloud virtual for all option, it got a lot smaller. Here we are six weeks later, and we are at a place where we believe conditions and cases for a number of factors that we're going to talk about support moving to that 100% virtual all contingency plan. That's a really challenging thing to think about, and the speed of change is something that everyone in our society and certainly in public education has to be able to respond to. Okay. For those watching at home, we're checking some technical things here. Okay, testing, good. Okay, so no, Sean, please go back, thank you. Oh, okay. Okay, so the good news for, for those that, um, in the wonders of editing, we'll be able to cut those 20 seconds out for those that watch the <laughs> podcast. For those who are watching live, thank you for your patience. So, uh, again, six weeks ago, we were talking and thinking about, is there a time to return more students to the classroom and reduce some of the mitigation? Those questions were being asked. Six weeks later, conditions and cases have changed significantly. And so that V in the upper right-hand corner uh, is really where we are. And I'm going to share tonight that recommendation that we're moving towards that virtual, 100% virtual for all at or near the Thanksgiving break that's coming up next week. And I'll share why. Uh, next slide, please. So it begins with some of the measures. So this, these are the Allegheny County metrics. We share these in the e-blast every Friday. We have been following and sharing these measures for almost 12 weeks now. And the two critical parts, and this comes from the PA COVID-19 early warning dashboard. First is incidence rate per 100,000. This, this talks to the amount of virus, again, that is in the community, as does the PCR positivity percentage. We have seen exponential growth in Allegheny County in terms of the incidence rate. So you can see over these, these recordings, uh, when we got to last Friday, which was the last released measure, we were at 138.7 um, in terms of the incidence rate per 100,000. That moved from what was yellow or moderate into what is reflected here in pink or red to demonstrate substantial spread. In the positivity, we went from below five, which is shown in green, to 7.7%. And again, this is based on PCR tests, which is in the moderate range. So I added a little box there that said, you know, in recent days, the region, state, and country have set daily records for confirmed cases and hospitalization. So what is being seen on a national level, what is being seen in Pennsylvania as a state, and what is being seen in our region, they mirror each other in terms of these measures. Next slide. So again, about six weeks ago, we put that dark green box in the middle up there. That's what we were talking about. Six weeks later, we added the one at the bottom middle that says new, when might a shift occur to the full virtual contingency model for all students? So what has changed? 
On the left side of the slide, we see those two key measures, incidence rate and PCR percent positivity. The red star is reflective of that 138.7 change. So now the incidence rate is in a substantial spread. The, the PCR positivity in the yellow star has moved into that uh, middle area. This is the model that was released in August by the Pennsylvania Department of Education and the Pennsylvania Department of Health to provide some thresholds or framework for school districts to consider how they offered their instructional program. And as we look to the right column there, we see in moderate, blended or full remote, and then in the substantial, it's indicating towards the full remote or what we refer to as the uh, virtual for all uh, contingency. Uh, next slide. So those are the conditions. The conditions have changed significantly and the conditions are, the, the cases are rising exponentially. Even in this, these first four days of the next se seven day reporting cycle, we see um, unprecedented numbers for our county in terms of the number of cases. So this is a change. What's different than a month ago? Almost everything relative to the amount of virus that's in the community and the number of confirmed cases that are happening. So this is, this is significant. Earlier today, all of the superintendents, uh, executive directors in Beaver County and Allegheny County were on a call with PDE and the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Allegheny County was, Health Department was on the call as well because we are now in the first week of what the state refers to as substantial spread. We're in the first week. We anticipate very clearly that on Friday of this week, when, we get the, new, when the new numbers are released, they will indicate that we'll be in, headed into our second week of substantial spread. And again, that is important because with it comes a recommendation from Pennsylvania Department of Ed and, and Health to move to a full virtual uh, model. When we learn of a case, so before I share specific case information with our students, parents, staff, and community, I want to talk about the process that we use when that happens. Really important. We hear words like transparency. We, wanna, we want transparency in communicating certain uh, information. This is very clearly and transparently the process that we follow uh, to respond to cases that occur. So first is notification. We become aware of a confirmed case of COVID-19 either by a of a student or of a staff member or of a parent. Most of the time, we learn of that from the family or from the staff member. Only rarely are we notified first because the test result was processed, went to the county, and then came to us via communication. So very often, we're receiving that information first, which is extremely helpful because then we can go to step two, which is gather initial facts and we organize our team. Our pandemic response team is well-practiced, cohesive, organized, efficient, effective in gathering that initial information. And then step three, we summarize that timeline and key facts with the Allegheny County Health Department. Allegheny County Health Department, despite the overwhelming number of cases in the, in the infrastructure that naturally exists, has really prioritized schools. We could not ask for more than what they have been providing us. And they couldn't ask for more than the quality of information and details that the Pine Richland School District shares with them. We give them every piece of information to help them best evaluate the nature of things. And then together we work on what is the appropriate next steps. And that may include some um, contact tracing. We, again, with Allegheny County step four, immediate action is determined. So in the case of a, a confirmed positive, that means the person is isolated. Uh, it means that any siblings in that home would be quarantined. And um, in the contact tracing part, 
if there are other areas to consider, we're able to quickly understand that and work in conjunction with Allegheny County Health Department to, to take all of that appropriate action or communicate. Uh, again, in, incredibly helpful. What matters during that whole process is the Pine Richland hybrid. So this, this is so tough to get through, but if our people, students, staff, et cetera, have been with discipline and fidelity implementing mask wearing, implementing the six feet of physical distancing that's built in, hand sanitizing and building cleaning. If that's happening, then it almost eliminates the chance for transmission within a school environment. So that's huge because that then impacts the number of people who may need to be quarantined given the status of close contact. And then finally, step five is monitoring the timelines for isolation or quarantine and communicating all of those things to relevant people. So I've said before, it's worth saying again, I'm incredibly proud to work with the team and of our school nurses and health department, just really um, the head of the class when it comes to, to professionalism. Next slide. So since the start of the year, we've seen an evolution. So in September, we had two cases of COVID-19 among students and staff combined. So the numbers we're showing here are students and staff. We had two. And think back to what did the conditions look like at that time, incidence rate and positivity. In October, we had five. In the first 16 days of November, we have had 24 students and staff combined. And a lot of that 24 has actually happened within the last 10 days. So the increase, the exponential increase in virus in the community, region, state, et cetera, we are seeing that in the reported cases that are happening within the school. So that's 24 times that we're working through that process on direct cases involving students or staff. In parentheses, it's noted 13 active, 11 resolved. That means that of those 24 cases, 13 of them are still within the 10 days of isolation that happened from symptom onset. 11 have passed through that window, and so the staff member or student is able to return to school or teaching uh, in an in-person setting. But again, uh, those are the specific numbers. What we plan to do beginning this Friday's e-blast is we plan to include our cases to date. So these measures will be updated to our community and staff every Friday, just like we do the other conditions. So a couple other key points here. First is important. Of those cases, those two and then five and then 24, they are distributed across our six schools. So there's almost no pattern to them. They are isolated incidents that we see in almost every case. And again, that's important to understand from the standpoint of decision making around what happens with the positive case. The totals for those that do not monitor surrounding area schools uh, are pretty consistent with other schools in our area. So proportionally, you would expect a larger school system like maybe a Seneca Valley to proportionally have a different number than you would a smaller school district like an Avonworth. Uh, but again, we're, we're right in line with uh, what is out there. As I mentioned, because of our model, we have had very little need to quarantine large numbers of students or, or staff. And that's because our people have taken the model seriously and they have followed those uh, precautions and we are able to be very specific uh, in our action. The last comment I'll make, uh, again, is repeating something uh, from Dr. Bogan and Dr. Brink, and that is both at Pine Richland and in Allegheny County, they're seeing little evidence of transmission in schools, and that's based on the highly regulated environment and precautions that we have in place. Next slide. I'm not going to go through this one. Uh, it's here so that it's reflected on the record but I did talk about it last month to some uh, degree of detail. Uh, but there is a balance in communication when it comes to awareness and then the privacy rights of individuals. So again, every Friday now, 
our community will receive the conditions, that's incidence rate and positivity, and the number of specific cases uh, to date for our schools. Next slide. The bullet that I wanted to emphasize on this slide is the very bottom one that's in bold. Uh, and that is one of the critical elements that has continued to be reinforced both by the science, the research, the experts that are on our Pine Richland Healthcare Leadership Council is that multi-layer cloth face coverings are the most effective, not just for protecting others, but also for protecting self. In Pennsylvania, face shields are permitted. That, that was part of that process. And there are exceptional cases where a student or a staff member may not be able to, um, to wear a, a cloth face covering. But absent that um, need, and again, that's the exception rather than the rule, we really want to emphasize for all of our families, all of our students, and all of our staff members, the most beneficial action that can be taken is a multi-layer cloth face covering that meets the um, sort of the CDC requirements. So in the PDF version of this, that's a hyperlink that comes, goes to the research on face coverings. Next slide. So I want to talk about this for a second, and we, we have been talking about this. So when PDE and the PA Department of Health came up with the first set of guidelines, which is on the type of instructional model, they also shared some initial thinking about when should schools close or consider closing for a period of time. We have said now for two months that that framework was antiquated. It was not accurate. It was designed at a time that COVID-19 was not fully understood in schools or to account for the differences in modeling that happens within those schools. So guidelines, not magic numbers. Today on the call uh, with PDE and the Department of Health, it was again stated that they are reviewing this to look at revising this because it's just not relevant. Um, and, and again, decision making around what to do when a case emerges has been made with very specific, very collaborative discussion with the Allegheny County Health Department, absolutely 100% focused on the health, safety, and well-being of our students and of our staff. Next slide. So again, just a quick summary. Amount of virus increasing, PRSD cases significantly increasing literally over the last 10 days. Um, we've done the contact tracing with fidelity every time. Little evidence of spread in schools. Where the county health department is seeing the biggest challenge are in social gatherings. They can be of small numbers, but they're in, in social gatherings where there's a lack of attention to some of the behavioral things like masks and distancing, et cetera. And that is leading to these little, little mini um, things happening in terms of the rates. And again, at Pine Richland, our cases have been distributed across all schools. Uh, hybrid makes a difference. And to this point, our staff-related cases have been very few. Uh, that's a little different, actually, than the metrics that are being seen in the county wide with respect to schools. It's almost two to one right now, students to staff. It is a much higher ratio here, which means we have much lower numbers uh, with respect to staff. And again, in every case, contact tracing occurs. Next slide. So what's happening that's different is right now, colleges and universities are mostly making decisions, if they haven't already done so, that as we get to Thanksgiving break, they're sending students home and they're asking students to remain at home and finish out their semester online. So what that means, and the challenge at colleges and universities, is that it's a communal living, it's dorm living, it's apartment living, it's, it's a challenging place to enforce the big three with a, a population of kids that are 18 to 21 years old. So all of those uh, students are coming home. When they come home, they could be infected, they could be asymptomatic, but ultimately they're coming back to their family. 
and they're spending time with their family. They're going to do the things as you would expect anyone to do when they're with their family. But it increases risk relative to transmission just by, by its nature. We have Thanksgiving holiday coming up, and a whole lot has been said and written about what, what that means. Um, first, the concerns were travel. Well, every place in the country, for the most part, is a hot spot. Our county, you don't want to, you know, so there is no travel that is necessarily a great place to travel. So the focus has been on what is smart travel. You know, smart travel, if it needs to occur, is travel that involves travel in a personal vehicle, with your family, going to a place with very few people, keeping your distance, all of those other precautions. Uh, but again, I've shared in different meetings, the reality is you can engage in undisciplined practices right here at home, not travel anywhere and get into a lot of, uh, we can get into a lot of challenge in terms of transmission of the disease. So it's, it's really less about where you go and more about how you get there and what you do while you're there that makes a difference. But we're headed into Thanksgiving and what we know about COVID-19 is and the transmission of the disease is, it will take 14 days following that holiday in order to understand, because of the incubation period, what that means. Um, and again, not just for Pine Richland, that's the question facing us in our country, in our state, in the entire region. And given the slope of the line right now with incidence rate, this is of major concern, um, again, across the country. Next slide. So. We've reached a place, and what we would like to do is, again, take the next few days to continue monitoring cases and conditions, but we fully expect that by Friday of this week, we're going to get an updated report from the COVID-19 early warning dashboard that has us headed into our second week of substantial transmission. And with that will be a recommendation uh, from PDE, PA Department of Health, to go into a full virtual uh, learning model. But the first bullet is, is something that I really want to emphasize. And I think it's the thing I struggle with the most in the whole topic of how we manage schools and how we manage COVID-19 and how we make decisions. Closing schools or going to a virtual learning model for all does not necessarily mean we're going to help the level of virus transmission in the community. Because when children are with us in our schools, they're in a highly regulated, structured environment with distancing and masking and all sorts of other precautions. The Allegheny County health experts say it's not in the schools. It's in the social activities and her behaviors that, that are of risk. However, there are factors that we, we need to consider and factors that are leading us to make this recommendation at this point that we transition. And again, for a time period, we're talking about transitioning to full virtual for all at or around the Thanksgiving break based on what happens here over the next few days. And then we would need to communicate all of that information to students, staff, parents, and the community. So the factors are, first, uh, either Allegheny County recommendations or PDE, PA Department of Health. So I've already shared with the board that the PDE, PA Department of Health that is coming. We know it's coming. It will be, we expect it on Friday of this week uh, to recommend full virtual. We have seen um, a significant increase in cases. To go from two to five uh, in the first two months to 24 in basically a 10 to 12 day period uh, is a significant change and it's reflective of the increased nature of the virus uh, in the community. The, a critical part, and this is really important to understand, staffing shortages and substitute shortages. And so this staffing is a challenge, not just here, but across schools. So if a teacher cannot be at work, maybe it's because they're in quarantine. They're well and healthy. They might even be teaching virtually, but they cannot come to work in order to do that job. That means we need a substitute, another adult present in that room while that's happening to make that work. We have seen an increase in daily um, 
absences from in-person attendance as we've also seen the uptick in all of the other um, parts of this. And so again, that leads to challenges in instruction, it leads to challenges in, in supervision. Uh, and there are some other things, again, what makes it different, the last bullet, we have increased risk coming here with Thanksgiving, increased risk related to travel, increased risk relative to the social gatherings that occur, and what the impact of that is going to be. Uh, next slide. Okay, this, this topic is included because it came up as a question actually at our mid-October uh, board meeting, and that was, can we evaluate distancing? So this slide doesn't sort of seem to fit with the direction of the other questions we've been asking, but I wanted to make sure we addressed it and provide the information for our community. So six weeks ago, the question was, can we bring back more students and decrease physical distancing between those students? And at that time, six weeks ago, we said, let's pump the brakes, let's evaluate what's going on, and we'll find out. So we went back to our uh, healthcare leadership experts and available literature. And again, at this point, there is nothing that's suggesting that a reduction in physical distancing from six to three uh, would be good. And in fact, um, just using our example, if we had had that, the amount of quarantining that would be necessary because we don't have the physical distancing uh, would be significant. Next slide. Okay, so um, again, so there's some positive news on the horizon. So one of the challenges right now is the exponential increase in cases is leading to increased use of, of need for hospitalization, which may test the capacity of healthcare. We're hearing about that here from our healthcare experts differently than ever happened in the summer. So there was conversation about that capacity issue in the spring and summer that did not come to fruition. There's a level of concern that exists now in our healthcare environments that is different than that point. On the positive side, what the experts are telling us is their knowledge and ability to treat to provide therapies is improving, uh, not only for Pfizer, but there's, uh, there are other examples of some positive uh, outcomes related to vaccines that may be coming. So there is a hopeful tone, but that is, um, from the best of our understanding, that's not going to impact what happens over the next few months. That is something that has the potential to impact over a large, uh, a, a bigger window of time uh, but is not going to be of immediate uh, impact. Next slide. Okay, and so again, finally, this is something we've been talking about literally uh, since the beginning. And schools are just one part of the ecosystem. What we do and how we do it throughout our communities has an interrelated and interdependent effect on, on everything else that's happening. One of the examples um, again, that I think it's an example that's worth thinking about. So we get data on the age range of confirmed positive cases. And a lot of times in a public school environment, you'd look immediately to the school age. You know, what's happening in 5 through 18? But what we see is an increase in confirmed cases among parents. Well, parents are close contact of kids, and that's what happens in the home. And again, we're seeing that college age students and the impact that that's going to have. Uh, so again, we encourage at every one of these meetings, sort of as a public health service announcement, one of the ways that we can help our schools and help what's happening is to really uh, invest as a community in the big three. And by doing it, it makes a, makes a huge difference. Um, so again, uh, Steve, for the purpose of the presentation, that'll be, that'll be it. We have included the Healthcare Leadership Council members again on the next slide, uh, but again, wanted to, to share that recommendation um, with the board. It's, all, it's always been a part of our health and safety plan. We've been talking about the continuum for months and months, uh, but what has changed are the incidence and the positivity rate, 
uh, what has changed or some of the other factors that are coming in with colder weather, with being indoors, with social gatherings, with Thanksgiving break. And as we think about continuity for kids, we do not want to be in that place where we're going in and out and in and out in a loss of, um, of continuity of learning. We believe based on those conditions, we should be moving towards the 100% virtual for all with more information on specific timelines coming out to our student staff and families in the, by the end of this week for that transition. And from, from our perspective, we would be looking at a timeline that is around um, initial timeline that would go through the month of December. Uh, it is my belief that it will go longer than that. Um, once we get to winter break, we have the same challenge with gatherings, uh, but initially uh, through the month of December so that we are able to plan for and manage the transition, get into the rhythm of continuity of learning in a virtual way, and then throughout that time continue to monitor the conditions and cases. Thank you. Any questions or discussion from the board? So we always get the question about comparable school districts. Uh, I know a lot of the area schools around us have already announced they're going virtual. Like Seneca Valley is going until uh, January 4th, I believe, all virtual. Or what, you know, what updates on the regional schools are doing? Well, what I have found through this, pro so yes, to some degree, I'm aware of what's happening around us. But everyone has really taken a different approach through the entire process with different measures in place. So um, I would definitely see this as where more people will be going. It's just a matter of when they get there. So thank you for that update. I just wanted to offer one other perspective on it. And that you, you showed the stats of 138 per 100,000 for the county. You can also look at it at the zip code level. And if you do that, it's actually even higher for our district. That reflects a number of different things, but this cautious approach and the growth of the disease in our community, it's clear that it's here. We have evidence that it exists at the zip code level and not just aggregate county information. And I think it's useful to think about that as well too. The one thing I'll, I'll address just because of what I do is I know we're already having issues with substitute teachers, but within the region as a whole, I hear from other school districts, they just cannot fill substitutes um, and it's only going to get worse. So I, 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 you know, this is definitely proactive and something that we need to, to talk about and to do. So at a certain point, right, and you mentioned a few of those, but just to be really explicit, you have uh, multiple situations in which an infection or a, you know, a need for isolation causes someone to be temporarily unable to work, right? Correct. So it could be taking care of a child whose school closed. It could be taking care of a child who <clears throat> is infected. It could be a quarantine to avoid coming in, all those situations. So even with each case, there are multiple ways where it could impact many people in a household or close contacts for that case and take them sort of temporarily out of our workforce. What are those challenges in our building when, when you're, you know, so the teacher teaches virtually, so we're all good, right? Someone else want to take that? <laughs> I mean, I have the answer, but I'm tired of it. Go ahead. So, so the teacher can be there virtually, we still need to substitute someone in the room with the students to be able to supervise them, facilitate things, et cetera. And so we have even tried to offer some substitutes we've done a lot of work um, recruiting that way um, but it, it severely taxes things so even today I'm aware of a school that had to combine two groups of kids in a larger space to have one adult be able to supervise them but maintain the six feet of distance so we're already starting to see that type of um, issue happening um, across the schools um, I'll give you another example you know secondary level for the most part if we don't have enough substitute coverage, then what that does is that falls on our staff. So instead of a duty or a plan period, then they are covering classes for 
colleagues that can't be there or we just need somebody to supervise the room. That impacts instruction because that is perhaps their planning period. So instead of planning and preparing for instruction, they are supervising students. So it does have a ripple effect in different places. Now, much like the, uh, the, the pre-stockpiling pre, pre PPE gear, we, we actually secured an additional short-term subs at the beginning of the school year in a significant number. And we're, we're through those numbers, you're saying now. So we, did, we actually did two things. So we added 14 short-term subs in order to increase the workforce at the K-3 to level so we could offer more in-person instruction while maintaining physical distancing. In addition to that, we initially brought on about 25 day-to-day -day substitutes through Kelly and at Kelly's staffing services and told them, we'll give you work every day. We want you to come every day so that we had the flexibility to support that. Since that started and based upon some of the needs that we just talked about, we have been trying strategy after strategy to grow that bench even larger uh, in order to provide those supports. And the bottom line is, as the virus, the impact of the virus directly and indirectly increases, all of those things are tugging on the ability to staff effectively and making it hard to, to implement the program. So at what point, and I imagine your answer will be like much of this, there's not a specific threshold. Does, does all that work just to get back? Is it not worth it? You're spending more time to correct, to patch, to plug a hole here than you are focused on instructional time. Are, are we, I'm getting the sense that we're, that we're closer at that point. Yeah, well, I would say we are at that point. And when we combine that again with, we're now a substantial transmission community. We have, at Pine Richland specifically, seen 24 cases in the last 10 to 12 days, which is exponentially different than we saw in September and October. We are preparing for the winter season. We are bringing everybody indoors. We are seeing all of those factors that were of concern. We're seeing that happen. We know that we're headed into Thanksgiving, which again is a significant concern. So we have all of that stuff happening at the same time. And as we think about continuity of learning, we have also built the capacity of our staff and students to learn through technology. Now, my heart breaks because I believe the hybrid we have in place has some incredible things happening. So that, that is really tough because, I mean, we've been in all of our schools. We see that happening. At the same time, when I think about where we are today and where we are in April of 2020, and how much we have built in terms of capacity, skill, students, staff, tools, and technologies. You know, we are in a much, we have even practiced for this uh, to be able to make this transition. So we believe now is the time, and we believe, um, again, in reality, this might be an extended time. We're suggesting that we make that transition, you know, at or right before Thanksgiving uh, through the end of the calendar year, uh, but there's a good likelihood it will extend beyond that. And, and we would keep the uh, the short-term substitutes because for the continuity of teaching for the these the younger children. Um. Correct. So when a transition would occur, it was our, it would be our recommendation that those 14 uh, short-term subs continue. They've built the classroom connection, relationship, instruction, etc. Uh, the the staff that we would need less of are the day-to-day -day substitutes. Right. We may need some support but we can build other um, redundancies into the way we go about this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, if someone falls ill, we have other teachers to be able to share. So we, we have more problem solving and sort of innovation to consider, uh, but we would need less of the day-to-day, -day, not of the STS. Mm -hmm. okay. I know we're not there yet, but, but if it comes back, and I'd almost like to see it on the way out too, the, the students who might need the face-to-face -face more, i.e. the younger students, I think it's harder for them to learn virtually. There's exceptions at every level. Um, might there be a plan to either delay them going full virtual and or bring them back first versus everyone else? That's number one. Then number two, one of the challenges I see um, from a teaching standpoint is with all the other schools closing down, because not every teacher lives in Pine Ridge, but many of our teachers mm -hmm. have children of their own, to try to teach 30 kids virtually 
and teach one, two, three of your own children at home in that setting, that's a challenge. Is there is there a way to incorporate some of those short-term subs that, that you're talking about we might not need necessarily um, for in-class? Could they help with the virtual to help relieve some of that burden so that the instruction is delivered as efficiently as possible? I, I, I'm sure you're looking at everything, but that's just a question that comes yeah. up to me. So, so I think um, <clears throat> what we'll do is what we always do which is we'll continue we number one we've designed a good plan and that plan will get us started we will then evaluate the effectiveness look for ways to collaborate and make it better and all sorts of things come up like you just described that we're going to have to work through uh, but we also said once we got through the end of last year that if we were to return to this model we would do some things differently we would increase the amount of synchronous instruction Right? We would provide different levels of assessment and support. We would try to mirror the instructional program in a much uh, more effective way. So there's a lot of um, adaptation modification that will happen. You know? So increasing in synchronous instruction by design doesn't mean every person, every day, every period but it does mean more often. So at the secondary level, that looks differently in our design model than in the elementary level. And so we built out that um, virtual for all contingency podcast and all, we did all of that. Like we've built that out. So we'll be bringing that back, implementing, refining, revising, improving, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, even, even those, even the younger learners, they now have a Chromebook in front of them. They've had that. Like, that's been hardwired into the way they've been learning, even in the in-person environment. So this transition is so different than the transition we felt in the spring. It's just like a totally different world. It's disappointing. Yeah. I, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed because of the just frankly Herculean efforts that have gone into defending in-person instruction uh, in its various forms in this district. Uh, tremendous efforts by those in this room, all the teachers, all the instructors. Uh, but as a community at large, there have been some failures. Uh, we have not succeeded in containing community spread. And this is the impact, unfortunately. So I know. Uh, some, many in this room, uh, thought we may not make a month or two of in-person. So uh, we should count that as a blessing. We've gotten some solid instructional time in, uh, in these months. Unfortunately, we're hearing the real logistical challenges that defending this wall uh, just becomes too hard uh, because we're, we're of this community, we're part of the region and the area. And uh, if those logistical difficulties start to impinge on our ability to deliver instruction as well as compromise potentially community safety uh, we will be compelled to continue that move toward virtual i understand any other so just one one final comment unless there are any other questions so tentatively again so we're, we're looking at making that transition uh, prior to thanksgiving break it's our thought that, again, we'll monitor the next couple of days, then we'll get a communication out to everyone. Our plan was to have one day that's sort of a transitional day for families to get themselves and students to get organized and ready and for staff members to be able to organize their, their work and preparation. So, you know, again, we'll monitor this week. Uh, things can change based upon, Kate. I mean, something could change tomorrow that accelerates the timeline, uh, or we can be in a position maybe where that transition day is next Wednesday, 
the day before Thanksgiving. Uh, but either way, we're planning on a transitional day. That's where students are at home and, and just getting ready to go. Staff has that opportunity to have a day to make sure that they're in order so that when we return virtually from Thanksgiving break, we're ready to hit the ground running. Thank you. Any other board questions at this point? We'll move to our first recognition of visitors. Ms. Williams? We do have one person. We have Brock Heinauer who uh, has asked to speak. So uh, if Mr. Stobener would please try and reach him on the phone. Hello. Hello, Mr. Heinauer. Yes. Hi, you are in the room with the board, so you go, you're right, go right ahead and address them. Okay, perfect. Uh, first off, I just wanted to uh, thank everybody for your time. Um, I was listening in on the speech that was going on about uh, switching to all virtual, and I just wanted to uh, and my opinions um, about what the district should be doing uh, requests um, obviously you know there's a lot that goes into these decisions and I didn't want to just sit by and not let my voice be heard so here goes um, I heard and 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 bear with me I, I was preparing some remarks to say but then I realized at the beginning of the speech um, that we, it sounds like we are going to be switching to all virtual. So I tried to just listen in and compile some thoughts and things about things that were said and just offer some rebuttals and or different perspectives. Um, and also too, let me say first that I appreciate everything that Dr. Miller, uh, the uh, COVID response team, the board has done, uh, the, the, the way that the, school district has moved through this process has been very, very impressive. And just as a resident in the community, um, I'm very appreciative to live here and see the way that things have been done. So thank you all for the work that you've done. Um, I think I'll start with just in general, I heard, I heard a statement being made during this that um, the, the kids being in school is not where the virus is being spread. And it's the social gathering, the hanging out outside of school or parents or family members, friends, et cetera, um, is where the virus is being spread. And with all due respect, I think it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory that if you close schools, whether you want people to do their part or not to social distance or to stay inside and not gather in, in large groups, that social gatherings are going to go up. And so while it may not be the best decision on paper to keep school open. I think logistically from that perspective, there's some things to consider of why kids should remain in school. Furthermore, um, I heard the uh, point being made about uh, our staff um, having, having relatively low numbers uh, compared with the ratio of uh, staff to student ratios of confirmed cases that re as it relates to other school districts. And I think that's another very important metric to consider because you know obviously the school board is is interested in what's best for the children and that's what we're talking about here and i know there's a lot of data going in a lot of different directions about COVID 19 but one that's been pretty consistent is that children have virtually no threat of the virus of getting you know very very sick from it so um i understand the idea of them transmitting it to other people and and that staff can be at risk and that's something to be concerned but obviously it sounds as if our staff numbers are are relatively low so again something to consider uh when making a decision of whether to go all virtual or not um as i move forward um you know i think i'll, I'll talk just a bit about my family and, and how it relates to us and i'm sure that can be translated to you know all different makes up, makeups of families in the in, in our community. I heard the term, uh, you know, the Chromebook has been hardwired into the way that they've been learning. My wife and I are incredibly against green time, digital learning, 
Mr. Heidenauer, you've gone out. We can't hear you right now. Hello? There you are. You can keep going. Okay. Um, furthermore, we have a five-year-old son. He's in kindergarten. Um, he's in the process of getting an IEP, uh, to which he'll most likely have a personal aide that works with him. And my wife and I know full well firsthand there's literally no physical way that he can learn virtually. He doesn't have the attention span to sit in front of a computer by himself. My wife and I have five children, ages eight, seven, five, three, and two. Virtual learning in general for our family is, is virtually impossible. I understand the, the different measures that will be taken this time around as compared to last spring. Well, and I'll, I'll openly admit I don't fully understand them because they haven't been laid out for us yet, but I understand that there's a lot more planning that goes into this time around. But just in general, from a, from a sheer timing perspective of how much time in a day that, that my wife has to allot to our little babies and our school-aged children, uh, and then working with our five-year-old who has special needs. It's simply not possible. So as we move forward and do that, if we are forced to go to some virtual, to, if we are forced to go to virtual learning, I would ask that there are some considerations that are made <clears throat> um, on behalf of, you know, families that have varying circumstances that uh, to which this makes, you know, these situations are exceptionally difficult for. Um, number one, as it relates to my, my son and also to other kids or other families that have special needs in our community, I think the idea of prohibiting uh, in-person learning for various circumstances is not a good idea. I understand the risk and the concern, um, but when it comes to children who have special needs, there, there's really no substitute. I, I know that there's probably a general argument made in social circles between people arguing of you need to be safe and from the virus and virtual learning is okay. And there's other people that feel that, well, it's, it's contributing to rise in anxiety in kids and having to wear masks and all this stuff is just not really good for their psyche and they should just be going about life as normal. But I don't really think that there's any argument that can be made against the idea that whether it's kids who have uh, autism and or learning disabilities, ADHD, ADD, other, other things that, that really, really, really make it difficult for them to flourish and succeed in an online environment. Um, I, think that, I think that special considerations really, really need to be considered for those kids. Um, and then lastly, um, our other children, as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot. Of, we have a lot of kids. It's really difficult for us to to online virtual learn. Um, my my older daughter, she, um, while you know she doesn't have nearly as a difficult situation as my younger son, she has a lot of anxiety and used to be the girl who absolutely loved going to school. And now she comes home every day. She hates it. She cries about two or three days coming home after school, and. The, the constant back and forth of whether it's we're in school or out of school, wearing masks, having the dividers, um, limiting contact with kids. I just, I, I think that there are, I think there's more to consider here than just the amount of cases that we have. So as we move forward and decisions are made, again, I respect everybody's opinion and the information shared um, I don't uh, wholeheartedly disagree with everything that was said tonight. I, I, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of vital information uh, to be learned from and to be used as we move forward. But at the same time, I think that there's more to consider than just how many cases there are, and that automatically leading to a shutdown of schools. So uh, thank you for your time, and that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any other visitors at this time? 
Student and staff recognition, Ms. Hawthorne. Thank you. Uh, Pine Richland School District was one of only five organizations to be recognized by the Mid-Atlantic Alliance for Performance Excellence on November 12th. In addition to Pine Richland, <coughs> other organizations receiving the MAPE Award for 2020 included Eden Autism of New Jersey, Highmark Health IT of Pittsburgh, Penn Medicine, uh, Department of Radiation Oncology of Philadelphia and UPMC Western Maryland. As you know, MAPE serves PA, New Jersey and Delaware and is focused on helping organizations achieve improved levels of a performance by identifying and recognizing role model organizations. MAPE applicants, including Pine Richland, were evaluated in seven areas defined by the Baldridge criteria. Dr. Miller accepted the award on behalf of the school district and uh, it was held virtually, the awards program last week. He serves as a senior examiner at the national level with Baldrige, as does Dr. Justice also serves as an examiner in the national level, and Ms. Greta Kazilia and I serve as examiners for me. So uh, a big day last week for that. Also, three middle school students are being recognized for their writing. Students were challenged in teacher Jason Prusi's classroom to write letters to published poets as part of the Dear Poets project last spring. Recently, the Academy announced that eighth graders June McCune, Parker Scott, and Taylor Wackery were chosen to have their letters published. Also, 2017 Pine Ridgeland High School graduate Hunter Baxter will be inducted into the University of Maryland, Omicron Delta Kappa Sigma Circle in December. ODK is a nationally recognized leadership society and acknowledges students and faculty who have contributed to the campus through leadership. 1974 Richland High School alumna Kathy Strauss is one of, of a lab specialist who has help, been helping researchers at the University of Maryland School of Medicine in helping Pfizer COVID vaccine trial. Most recently, she was featured in an article in Rolling Stone. Uh, in addition to science, she's a working artist. Athletes are participating in Whippeal and PIA AA championships. The Pine Richland High School football team won the Whippeal championship game this past weekend and will take on Governor Mifflin High School on November 21st at 1 p.m. The game will be, we're looking into the game being streamed on PRTV. Also, field hockey captured the 3A championship title and will take on Central Dauphin at Central Dauphin in the PIA Double A semifinals tomorrow night at set five. You can also view the game via PCN. Junior midfielder Riley Woolington was named a Play Safe National Field Hockey Coaches Association High School Player of the Month. The girls' varsity volleyball team was stopped in the second round of Whippeals and the girls' soccer team in the first round. 11th grader Meredith Price finished 10th overall in the PIA AA Cross Country Championships. Ninth grader Angela Hunkley finished 25th and 12th grader Victor Williams finished 29th. Seniors participated in National Letter of Intent Signing Day on November 11th and included baseball player Tommy Bean, track and field runner Danielle Bryant, soccer player Katherine Rischel, field hockey player Ella Rodinghaus, and lacrosse player Haley Albrecht. You can visit pinerichland.org slash athletics for more. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hawthorne. <coughs> Correspondence, Ms. Williams. Renee Hoy emailed the board regarding redistricting and bus stops. Jennifer Neal emailed the board regarding return to school. Judy Masucci and MJ Klimas emailed the board regarding dress code and <coughs> student expression. Thank you. Item 1.06 is a motion to approve the meeting minutes as attached. May I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 2.01 is a strategic plan update from the administration. Dr. Miller. Yeah, so we do this on a quarterly basis. These are, this is a narrative summary of our key initiatives for this year. Uh, and what we thought we would do is just open it up for any questions about any of those uh, topics. Well, I have a question for board members uh, who took place on our last meeting. We talked about 
diversity, equity, and inclusion, we talked about how it connected to a policy. From that point, uh, four of us indicated, in, in three in addition to Dr. Meyer, <coughs> interest in participating in the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion leadership council. I, I look at it a little bit like an in-depth program review for, for diversity, equity, and inclusion in that in the meetings, we identified opportunities for education, enrichment, uh, learning on our own, uh, research, looking for exemplars, what to do, and things like implementation. So I was uh, very heartened by what I saw. It gave me a sense of purpose uh, that I understand uh, the, the, the work that's outlined, that there's a firm commitment, that the right people are, are in place doing it. Um, we broke into subgroups. It was a fairly big number. Dr. Justice, who is about 40? We invited approximately 40 folks to take part um, in the overarching video. And we were able to break out, and so I don't know if uh, other people were in different breakouts. I was in a breakout discussing in, in specifically policy, so I know <clears throat> I'm interested in making sure we're, we do research and exemplars. It can have a connection, but it's much bigger than policy as well. It's, it's culture, in fact, maybe more importantly. Um, so, I don't know if other board members were on. Ms. Swope, if you have uh, want to offer your perspective on the council meeting as well. Yes, of course. Well, we as Pine Richland, we pursue our mission of um, building the culture of diversity, equity, inclusion, and mutual respect, of creating a safe learning environment and equal opportunities for every student. And we are committed to improvement, and there have been several initiatives to um, prove to create this uh, positive school culture. We, uh, we have adopted the anti-racism resolution. We are updating the non-discrimination policy. We're working directly with families and external partners to make sure that hate and racism have no place in Pine Ridgeland. So I am honored and excited to be part of the council um, my takeaways from the first meeting would, would be that um, the first step is to educate ourselves, to recognize our own implicit bias, and to seek understanding, and um, to have courage to speak up when we see injustice. Uh, we split up in those little breakout groups. We discussed um, several areas, um, including gathering community input, uh, because the, the council is, of course, limited by size, but we will be looking for ways to include some of the feedback from the community, from the families. Um, I personally was very happy to hear students' voices. We had a few senior students present in the council and I think that this um, feedback and their engagement is critical in shaping Pine Ridge on identity. For us as the board, it is so important to hear their voices because the decisions we make here, they directly impact their experience. And I think that for the students, this could be like a great lesson, civics lesson to participate in governing um, and shaping the future world. I think that we must be able to have difficult conversations, um, conversations that can cause discomfort, but we only learn and grow if we step out of our comfort zones. And um, conversations are understood like a two-way exchange, two-way communication. We talk and we listen. So we need empathy and open mind to listen well to see perspective of others. And we need the right language where we talk without causing pain for others. And the world is increasingly diverse place. So we as educators, I think we, we try to prepare students not just to be successful in our school district, but we try to prepare them for the future, for the world outside, for college, for workplace, for adulthood to help them be resilient, successful, good citizens. And I think that appreciating differences between people can only add value to human experience in a whole. 
Thank you. I want to applaud the, the administration for taking, taking this on. This is messy, difficult work, and it's not easy to do. Um, it's going to be uncomfortable to look at other people's perspectives than what you're used to looking at. Um, I applaud also the voice of the students. I think that is a critical piece. This is their day, lived daily lives. And I think that their voice needs to be amplified in this process. Um, you know, in the work I do, I see horrible consequences for students who aren't being presented with this type of opportunity to have difficult conversations and to learn outside of their normal comfort zone. I've seen students have their careers torpedoed because they make a comment and they don't realize it causes other people pain. So I think this is a very important step for our district. I think we have a lot of work to do, but I think we're making strides and I'm very proud that we're taking this on. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for involving the community and let's keep moving forward even if it's messy. I'll just add, I appreciated the way Mike and Kristen ran it and framed it. You know, these uh, types of things tend to drift uh, into nebulous uh, feel-good types of uh, sessions, but these had very specific goals to develop actionable uh, next steps. And I, that's what I really appreciate, that we came up with a number of really meaningful, actionable next steps. So thank you. buckets of, of research that Mr. Lyons re um, referenced, you know, we see policy, obviously that's, that's already moving, and with each policy that is implemented, that means training that has to go with that. So there's that staff development piece that will go hand in hand. Um, like everything, there's a desire for immediate change, and we understand that and appreciate that. We hear it on the curriculum side, we hear it on the social emotional side, that uh, we can't wait any longer because every day impacts my child in some way and we and appreciate that, that, that concern. Our um, comment back there is at the same time, if we move too quickly without really studying and understanding, then we're not moving to the point of sustainability and change that's gonna impact people for a significant period of time. So we have that challenge and balance that we're working through, but we think we've got a good Again, cadence of, of, of work sessions happening with our internal and external groups, uh, the policy work that will then be supported with staff development that goes hand in hand. We feel like that's the right starting point. Um, the student organizations and school culture is ongoing. That has been established through the Rams way and that will be integrated in. So uh, we think we've got some process. The curriculum and instruction piece really is firmly embedded in our in-depth program review. Um, and then again, we talk about community outreach and um, partnerships, and that's part of our design and learning anyway. So we think we've got the right pieces. Uh, the council's a great group of a diverse perspectives, which is wonderful. That's what you want in a council that's gonna help inform. So, and we really appreciate the board and, and of course student involvement, so thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any comments to share? or any comments on anything in the strategic update. I, I will mention you could take some of these items and have a committee meeting in other districts about some of these, uh, frankly. So I really did want to go down and talk about the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Leadership Council. The in-depth program review study phase, uh, special ed, world language, and art. There's an update here. We have to respond given the conditions and limitations we have under COVID-19, but I appreciate that efforts have been made to still move forward implementation phase for science, health, PE, math, you know, moving forward with adjustments. So the updates are there, I won't bother reading them, but I want people to be aware of the amount of work that's going on. Uh, friends at home, uh, call up the attachments, read them in depth, we do. That's what's going on when we say what's going on behind the scenes. Thank you. <clears throat> 
Finance, Mr. Kashani. Yes, sir. Item 3.01 is a motion to approve the financial reports dated September 30th, 2020 and accounts payable dated November 16th, 2020 in the amount of $979,541.19 and paid accounts for October and November in the amount of $1,873,696.98 as listed. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 3.02. Come on. Is a motion to approve the budget transfers in the amount of $26,318 as attached? Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 3.03 .03, is a motion to continue Pine Richland School District's membership in the Allegheny Intermediate Joint U Unit Joint Purchasing Board, which will be empowered to make bulk purchases of select selected items for 2021 with Dana Kirk, named as representative, and Rachel McCarthy as an alternate to the Joint Purchasing Board. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 3.04 is an informational item. The next finance committee meetings are December 14th to discuss uh, the audit and the budget for 2021, 2022, and then hopefully also March 1st, uh, which is dependent upon the uh, schedule, uh, the meeting schedule being approved later. And uh, that would be uh, also to talk about the budget and capital funding. Thank you, Mark. My pleasure. Mr. DiTulio, Buildings and Grounds. Item 4.01 is an action item, a motion to approve work to be completed by Shadler Yesco distribution through CoStars in the amount of $67,223.71 for a project to replace the parking lot lighting at the high school and the stadium. Second. Any discussions? It's late and it's getting close to Thanksgiving. Every time I see that, I think it's a turkey project, not a turkey project. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you worked with that all week, Ms. Williams. This is not a turkey project. Uh, this is actually a great win because of the reimbursement for insurance, so we're getting upgrade LED lights Any questions? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 4.02 is a motion to approve the electrical change order in the amount of $2,881 uh, $2, uh, through McCurley Houston Electric Inc. as attached. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And item 4.03 is just an information item that before this meeting we had a Buildings and Grounds Committee meeting. Um, we discussed multiple topics including athletic projects where they stand uh, and a big focus on capital funding and future projects for both, um, uh, well not just both, but a multitude of areas, athletics, um, buildings, uh, uh, upkeep, maintenance, um, and uh, how that impacts budget and funding. Does anyone want to add more to that, or are we good with that? All right. <laughs> it covered roofing and HVAC. Yeah, it, roofing, HVAC, items, right? touched all areas. Yeah, yeah. So I will, I will go back, and we're, we're all present for that. So we, we went through um, project lists. So we've got some, some th these aren't nuggets. What do you go, it's big boulders? <laughs> right. okay. the, the, these big are, rocks. some of them are Mount Everest. Mount Everest. Yes. <laughs> um, in our capital spend projected, uh, you know, over the next five to, to eight years. So it varies, obviously depends life of equipment. Some of it is, as you said, uh, non-negotiable. Can't teach without a roof that HVAC so those will be happening period and we will pay for those we have an athletic study 
that identified a need in the district in our facilities that could have been met by building a nice new field house um, that was expensive. It could also be met by reconfiguring and redesigning our interior main gym uh, and what's colloquially known as the green gym. Point of information, our main gym can't fit our entire, all our student body for a presentation, nor can they fit in the auditorium, frankly. So that's just one of actually the many needs uh, that a reconfiguration could address. Also not cheap, not free. Um, so depending on various options, it was from low four million to almost five million uh, to accomplish both those projects. And we touched, we don't have to decide, but we touched on framing those funding conversations. So that was a good conversation. However, and just because we are here together and it is fresh in our minds, and I don't anticipate new information on this topic, there was a question at the very end that maybe we can shed a little more light on, which was whether it's appropriate based on what we know, now know to move forward. Um, and I guess we'd do a formal resolution at the next meeting, at our next uh, combined meeting, uh, with the engineering study, um, which would fully spec out some of these things. There were questions about underground utilities, et cetera and give us sort of actionable plans that we could then move on and we would have that in our back pocket. And that was estimated uh, high 300s? Around 300,000, that's for schematic design, design development and construction documents. Is there interest in, we could put this on a December agenda then for approval? So I guess, again, we can put it on the agenda I know we're, we're here tonight and December, you know, we move through pretty quickly. We have academic achievement, we have reorg, and this thing would pop back up there. So I don't know if we want to discuss that or bounce that around a little bit right now first to give the administration an indication on where we are on that. Does anyone have a, a, an objection to it? I mean, we could add it right now. Yeah, I was going to ask the same question. Does anyone feel like it would not be a good use of money to develop the documents we need to to know it's sure. something that's going to be done it may not be done in the time frame we currently have specced out but it's going to be done it's a need but it's not necessarily a need like an HVAC or a roof so I see no reason why not to do it that's me yeah. if everyone's in agreement we can just add it right now Barb's awesome at adding that so yeah again <laughs> I, I would add that we did budget monies in the current year for portions of that project okay. so we have right the ability to address that and again having those documents does not compel a start date mm -hmm. but it certainly helps prime the pump for when we move forward that'd be huge yeah is there a formal motion required or one that you can add or is there not you do have to do a um bring business before the assembly to add a motion you're supposed to do that so we can do that and then we can do the motion Mr. Tertullio made a motion to bring business before the assembly. Okay. Second it. Second. second it. All in favor? All in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed? Yes. Okay. The agenda is essentially yours now. So okay. Okay. Your, your, your motion to bring business before the assembly was accepted. So what business do you bring before us, Mr. Tertullio? To approve the engineering of the reconfiguration of the main gym and the green gym. Does that cover everything, Dr. Yeah, Miller? I would say, again, schematic design, design development, and construction documents at approximately $300,000 uh, to be, which could be finalized uh, with Eccles architecture project planning, you know, once we get the details. Okay. Ms. Williams, I think I'd be correct to interpret that as a motion. That mm -hmm. is the motion that our mm -hmm. previous act mm -hmm. enabled you to make. Thank you for your motion. Mr. Trulio, do I have a second? Second. Second. Dr. Meyer seconded mine. <laughs> <laughs> if I could have seen your lips, it Yeah. It, <laughs> it would have helped. It was actually ventriloquist. That's what <laughs> <laughs> So the motion is on the floor. Ms. Williams, should I pause for a second or just move right forward and take the vote? No, go ahead. You're good. All those, any discussion on that motion? I know we did just discuss the concept. Any discussion here? I just have a request 
to consider a name, I, we have to use the the words a Swiss Army knife what? into yeah. the project somewhere. The Swiss, yeah. Swiss <laughs> Army knife. <laughs> that was a wonderful the description. Swiss Army of, gym. <laughs> yes. It is a multi purpose. It is a multi purpose. It's a Swiss Army knife. It was perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're talking about these we technicalities, but the, the work yeah, yeah. that came forward in that committee meeting was, it was, was great. Excellent it was awesome. In terms yeah. of breaking it down, I agree. But I am serious about that. <laughs> it can be the field six of gyms for a few more years. <laughs> Any other discussion or questions? So we're now voting to authorize the engineering. All those in favor, say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Dr. Meyer, academic achievement, which is great because we go to the five series because I don't know where Barb is on motion numbers. So. Special Education and Mr. Huswit may want to chime in on this as well, is such a large department that has tentacles into every area um, in terms of how we support students, how it impacts the regular ed classroom, et cetera. We stepped back and looked at um, our ability to truly study that, pull folks from the classrooms who are providing those interventions and potentially create an issue in terms of substitutes, et cetera, um, and really decided that deferring that for a year would allow us to best engage in an in-depth program review um, by every sense of the term. So that left us with art and world language, uh, which we then modified the process again, looking at the, the teachers um, currently, you know, going through several iterations of return to school um, and settling into where we are for this present time. Um, and then, you know, recognizing that um, there are likely changes on the horizon making use of the built-in in-service time seems to make the most sense for art and world language. It allows us to engage all members of those smaller departments. So that is currently the plan um, for the rest of the year. There are some things that we have asked them to do in advance of January when that would begin somewhat asynchronously via a podcast that we released. Um, and then we will carry forward all of that work together. Um, and it's the best kind of professional development that there is for a department. So uh, we're excited to move forward in a modified manner and look forward to the outcomes, and which may span beyond this school year, which is also not typical for this process, but we wanna allow ourselves the time to do it um, the right way without um, rushing things to a, a rapid conclusion. And my point here is we Thank you, Carla. Dr. Campbell, Student Services. Yes, item 6.01, we have a food service update from Mrs. Bucknell. Good evening. Can you hear me? What? Let's yeah. make sure we Go. get a mic that's working. We're, we're going to record this as well as a podcast. Um, because there's a, there's a meal opportunity that she's going to talk about that we want to make sure every single family understands exists. So okay. we're going to send this me? out. Okay. You're good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> good evening. Uh, thank you for letting me provide an update this evening. I'm um, going to talk a little bit about update what we've done so far for September and October. Uh, for food service, we've tried to uh, give the kids some normalcy inside the cafeteria. So I started off with some pictures. Um, we celebrated French week a uh, week or so ago. So we were able to do some crepes for the kids inside the cafeteria. That was uh, very popular. Um, so we're, we're trying to add some promotions in and keep the kids excited about coming in inside the cafeteria. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the changes that we've seen, uh, USDA meal waiver, and then we have a couple technology updates. We have a So Happy app 
and sedexomyway.com and then our meal pickup options. Next slide, please. So changes, uh, as in every area uh, of the school, food service has seen some changes for this year as well. Um, a big thank you to the district where we were happy to be in the cafeteria and have all six buildings open and students coming into the cafeteria. Staff was very happy to be back and serving them. Meal options, um, we had to obviously make some changes to make food service successful for us. Um, and that was reducing uh, the amount of options that we were able to provide our students. And that really was to provide uh, a quicker service for the kids to be able to keep them socially distant and have them come in and out of the cafeteria fairly quickly. So we felt that those changes have been successful. We also had to eliminate uh, any self-serve bars and uh, we've gone to all disposable for the students. So again, all of those have worked very well inside the cafeteria. Safety, so we have 36 frontline employees throughout our six buildings and to keep our students safe and to keep our staff safe we also made some changes um, there's a picture showing we added some plexiglass to the cashier stations we've eliminated the keypads so at our uh, younger our level we uh, created swipe cards so the kids can just swipe the cards and at the older levels, they just um, provide the cashier their number. And again, being that we're in the hybrid mode and um, half the amount of students, the, uh, the volume is very doable um, inside the cafeteria. So we've um, been able to, again, get the kids in and out. We feel in an appropriate time to get them back to uh, have their lunch. Also for the uh, out in the cafeteria, um, it's very quiet <laughs> most of the lunches which is different for this year uh, but uh, the kids are very socially distant at, at all the lunch tables and again that has worked out very well um, the last piece of this slide I just put our September and October numbers of serving just over 46,000 lunches and 8,200 breakfasts um, and 5,300 of those have been um, our pickup meals. So I'll talk a little bit about that uh, towards the end. Next slide. So the newest thing for this year is the uh, USDA meal waiver. This is something that uh, most districts would not see, uh, but because of the um, need for um, a lot of the communities, USDA, which the National School Lunch Program falls under, um, has um, in early September provided a waiver for school districts to provide meals, free meals for all students. Normally this would be based on a financial need, but USDA felt that it was vital to provide this to all communities. So um, the first couple weeks of school, we were still falling under the National School Lunch Program. And then um, mid-September, we were able to switch um, build out our um, application and qualify for the waiver. And again, this is important because I've had a lot of questions from families. Um, every student is able to get one breakfast and one lunch each day at absolutely no cost to them. And there's no paperwork. Um, as long as they're choosing a full meal, um, they just come through the line. The students don't even question uh, we just make sure uh, we ask them if, you know if they want to put a full meal together um, and they can just go on their way so there's absolutely nothing um, that the students or the families have to do to participate in this so by beginning of October we, we were told that this was gonna uh, probably cover us till uh, the end of December and then early October, USDA came out and said that this was gonna be extended for the whole 2021 school year. So again, for every student in our district, um, one breakfast, one lunch every day. 
that they can get. Um, and in our information to families, we've listed, you know, it's in person if they're here, it's for our virtual students that are 100% virtual, and it's for our hybrid students. Again, I'll talk a little bit about the pickup meals. Um, so again, if, uh, if a student's picking up any of the snacks or extra drinks or anything, that would require funds. But um, if they're just coming in for a full meal, um, then that meal is covered for them. Uh, the other question I had from families is, um, you know, does it take away from anybody else? And it does not. You know, every um, school uh, across the United States is uh, applied for a waiver and um, it, it's a benefit. And we've seen um, a lot of positive uh, comments from families when they're calling and asking um, that it's very helpful. So uh, next slide. The next two, um, we've been slow to kind of get our technology out just because it's been a little <laughs> different this year. Um, the So Happy is a new app which uh, we'll, we will start uh, promoting out to families over the next uh, couple weeks. Uh, this is where you would find your menus, um, your allergy information, and your nutritional and ingredient information. We are still using school cafe for uh, to pay online but so happy will be uh, the new app that um, again will be getting that information out uh, to families so if you're an Amazon person uh, you can communicate and ask uh, Alexia if um, what's for lunch at Eden Hall and she will tell you uh, what's for lunch so it will <laughs> be very interactive uh, once you get it once you get it up and running so that is our that is our so happy app. Next slide. So uh, the next slide is uh, Sedexo My Way, and again, it is another uh, location to find menus. When families call or if they're new to the district and they're wondering where to find the menus, I direct them to set Sedexo My Way. I call this the refrigerator version. So if you have usually your younger kids. They like to print the menu out. They like to circle what they're gonna buy. Uh, this is where you would go to, to get that refrigerator version that you can still print out and put on your refrigerator. Uh, so it is Pine Richland School District uh, dot .com. You can create a shortcut. That's where if you go to the Pine Richland website and click on uh, meals and menus, this is the site that it'll take you to. Um, and again, this one has all the, the fun pictures um, and uh, promotions on it. Uh, this also, uh, new to this year, does also have the nutritional information, ingredients, and allergy information as well. Um, this site also links you to um, Sedec or, uh, School Cafe, so you can pay online. Uh, it has a phone numbers for all the buildings, for food service, um, and tells you a little bit about your team, and uh, does uh, also link to free and reduced applications for for families. Next slide. So our meal pickup option, again, um, something very new for this year. Uh, we were able to start uh, in, in March, so we saw a small um, uh, participation when we were able to uh, quickly go to this from March to June. Uh, but this year, uh, we expanded uh, because we we're having our 100% virtual and with our hybrid model. Um, so we had created two locations. Uh, the high school and, the Eden, and Eden Hall basically provided the um, least amount of disruption to the buildings if we were you know, having cars come around and pick up meals. Um, and we were able to create two different times. So we have a Google form. Families fill it out weekly. Um, and then, you know, they can pick which location that they want to pick up from. Um, and our 100% virtual kids will get five breakfasts and five lunches at one time. And then the hybrids, depending what they're going, they'll get two meals or three meals. And the family only has to come once a week um, and to get their, their full meal. Um, and again, um, families that I've talked to, you know, um, the kids are very excited to open up their bag and find out which fruit and vegetable they have for the day. And then they try and 
you know, for the parents to make sure that it lasts for the five days and they don't all eat it at one time. But um, we have found um, success and um, whatever model we go to, 100% uh, virtual, this again would um, be expanded and uh, any family can participate um, and really it would be no cost to them um, just coming to pick up. The USDA waiver also allows, um, the student does not have to be there to pick up the meal, so, you know, uh, and it doesn't have to be a parent, so a grandparent can come. Um, we do have um, communities where one family is picking up for two or three families, so they're kind of sharing uh, the, the option to come pick up, um, so that has been helpful as well um, to be able to families participate that may not be able to um, come pick the meal up that week. And I believe that's my last slide. Are there any questions? I have one question. So it, when we consider switching to this 100% virtual, like you said, you will be able to logistically and safely like accommodate all this meal pickup for families, which is right. Yeah, we've already we have a plan in place. Um, you know, if our numbers would stay the same, if our numbers would add, you know, 400 additional pickup meals. Um, so uh, it, it it's ready to go. Um, we have a form ready, um, and we'll get communication out to families. Fill out the form by Sunday. Pick up yeah. on pick up on Monday. What's so yeah? So we um, it, currently right now, depending if you're 100% or if you're <laughs> which day of hybrid you are, um, you pick up on a Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, we feel if we go 100% virtual, uh, we'll probably be doing like a Wednesday pickup and um, keep the two locations, uh, possibly two times uh, to make it a, a little little bit more convenient. Um, and yeah, but it, it, it will be available for families uh, the whole time. Well, I hope people too do take advantage of it. I yeah. mean, if you have two or three at home virtually and this alleviates a bit of the chore of getting meals ready for children, and that's always a chore, um, <laughs> you know, please, I hope people do take more advantage of this then. Yeah. You couldn't have been more clear. It is free for <laughs> all, it is free today. It will be free tomorrow, no matter yes. what choices we make in our educational plan. It's free for everyone. Yeah. For the rest of the school year. For the rest of the school year. <clears throat> the rest of the school year. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. And thank you to your team for the flexibility. Thank you. Uh, item uh, 6.02 is a Hall of Fame update. Uh, we recognize our new inductees on Friday, October 16th. Um, and uh, due to COVID, we won't be able to have the, the banquet uh, at this time, but there is a video presentation honoring the inductees that uh, can be watched. So again, congratulations to all those inductees for the uh, Hall of Fame. Uh, Athletic Hall of Fame. Uh, item 6.03 is an action item, a motion to approve the revised athletics activities, health and safety plan as presented. Uh, Dr. Pasquinelli, do you want to tell us a little more about the, the changes there and updates there? Second. Oh yeah. Did you second that? We didn't second that. I just seconded. Sure. Now, th I thought that's when we go to discussion. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, okay. I just, I just appreciated that quick support. Right, right. <laughs> um, so the uh, <coughs> athletic and activity plan, you know, we wanted to bring it forward again. We know we've done this multiple times, but as Dr. Miller mentioned earlier, there's just constant change. With constant change, we feel obligated to provide the community with updates, and obviously this will impact uh, winter sports as they make plans. They are currently in phase one, which is conditioning. And um, in order to move into phase two and phase three, which is some um, tryouts, practices, and competition, they have to take a look in the modifications of, of, of the plan. So that's why we're bringing it forward. Uh, PIAA, uh, as they did in the fall, they have submitted guidelines for winter sports as well. That's linked into this plan for our community and our coaches and anyone else that's interested to read. Uh, we do have two high-risk sports um, that um, will be competing in the wintertime. That's wrestling and competitive cheer, as identified by PIAA. So we have additional expectations for uh, mitigation efforts that we have described in the fall. Um, what we're proud of is our experience that we had with our fall sports. 
as Ms. Hathorne mentioned earlier, you know, we have a couple of teams that are still <coughs> in competition mode, uh, and um, hopefully they'll be able to complete that in their seasons, which again come down to a couple more games. But we believe in large part they were able to do that because of the um, consideration by the coaches, the implementation, setting those expectations, and of course the students and families following it consistently. And we see when that happens, um, we've been very fortunate, fortunate but also um, intentional. And that's why we think this is a good plan that we'll continue to update and, and bring forward. So a couple of the key highlights, we have added um, some of the um, capacity limits for indoor experiences now. So that is through guidelines that was received from the um, Pennsylvania Department of Health uh, in terms of expectations of what we can um, look at in terms of a ceiling. Now remember, ceiling numbers are different than uh, physical distancing numbers. So you may see in this, in this document a number that was 20% of maximum capacity, but then on an event we may bring less depending on physical distancing and what we're able to do there. But they're good guidelines. <coughs> um, the reality of full virtual would mean um, that we would pause winter sports uh, for a period of time, but uh, that's something that again we think we can look at in iterations as, as we see this evolve. So uh, that would mean that um, High school winter sports would be paused if we go full virtual, uh, but a period of time goes by and we continue to monitor conditions and, and ability of staff to engage with kids. That's something that we're willing to look at and, and revisit and discuss. If we do go full virtual again, as we did in the spring, that's an expectation of um, uh, some type of connection between coach and athletes in a, in a virtual mode to keep them doing things and, and staying active as, as possible. Uh, but that's something, uh, again, that we'll continue to, to look at. The middle school winter sports, uh, again, we have communicated with those coaches that right now that is on pause. We did that in the fall as well. So we started the fall with varsity programs, high school programs only. Uh, we monitored the implementation of those plans and then we introduced middle school. We would do the same, we would do the same thing. Uh, and then again, interestingly, as we were developing this, started you know weeks ago, uh, we were talking about introducing um, outside groups back into our facilities, and we have done that with PRA with a very small group of of students in grades five through eight uh, that we're able to bring them back following their their <coughs> plan of um, health and safety. Uh, and considering other groups, again, we said that the determination of whether or not we could bring other outside groups in really would be the scope of the need of space and, and mitigation efforts. So again, we're pausing that for at this time. But we think, again, moving forward, we hope at some point there will be possibilities. Outside of athletics, again, uh, band just did a fantastic job. They had a lot of opportunities to perform um, in front of uh, different audiences. Uh, so we got a lot further than we anticipated starting. And if you got a chance to watch the game Saturday night, I was proud to see how they were spread out, how they were massed, and even if you looked at our student section, which again, we got better over time. Weeks ago, we weren't as proud, but we did see that the students and the staff really got the point across that, you know, it's tough to keep kids that are excited about a game separated from each other because that's their natural tendency. But it also says you know, they understand the importance and, and, and what we're trying to do for them. Um, so band did a great job. We have things like uh, high school and middle school musical that are starting. And uh, those will be very different, obviously, but they're looking at innovative ways <coughs> to make that happen. And that'll be like a middle school movie as opposed to a middle school um, you know, traditional musical that we've all seen and loved. But there's a there are ways to continue to move these forward, even in a uh, virtual environment, that our staff uh, will find ways to continue to connect with kids. So those are the updates. Everything in blue font is, um, has been modified from the last time you've seen it. Uh, and uh, if approved tonight, then our coaches will be use it, using it to prepare for when they can start with their competition and tryouts. Even with going full virtual, there's no plan to shut down sports that are finishing their seasons? That's correct, yeah. Okay. Um, so we have two left. That's field hockey and, and football. Um, again, we believe that they have they have implemented their plans. Uh, those those teams have been working in pods for this period of time. 
that we feel comfortable, uh, provided there's no need to quarantine the team, we feel comfortable supporting them as they go through. The last game, if we would make it to the state championship in football, was 11:27, so that's not too far off. Uh, that's actually the day after Thanksgiving, and if all goes well for our field hockey team, their championship game is 11:21 this Saturday. So um, again, fingers crossed, everything works out, and uh, they're able to continue. And there's no sports that span. I'm thinking hockey off the top of my head, but is that going to be spot paused, or is that going to be dictated by the PIHL? Yeah, so that's that's an interesting question because they are a partially funded yep. activity. Hockey has already started their season, so they've already had. They, and again, our our coaches they're not our coaches. Remember, they're partially funded, so they but they do work well with us, and they have submitted um, health and safety plans based upon where it was. Now they may have to make some slight modifications based upon um, the, the changes here, but uh, hockey has started their season. Um, our um, at that point, there becomes a decision of the hockey program in terms of, because they're using outside facilities, they're not our coaches, they have their own governing board, so it's a, it's a bit different than PIAA and Whitfield guidelines. Right. Um, so that, uh, I think they'll make some determinations themselves of what they're going to do. I guess, I guess my question is, from the school standpoint, as long as they meet all the guidelines with, that we have set forth, and that the governing bodies have set forth. Right. They can continue their seasons, like football and field hockey. It's just a delay or a pause on the sports that would kind of start after the fall sports That's end. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So winter for us is <clears throat> basketball, boys and girls, um, swimming, and, um, and wrestling. I mean, those are, our, those are our, our sports for winter. And like I said, they have started conditioning. So they started phase one, uh, just like we did in fall. We started before the season. Uh, but at, the, you know, at this point, at least in a short period of time with going full virtual, we're going to pause them okay. with, with keeping an eye on an opportunity to perhaps get them reintegrated back into some in-person conditioning without contact, uh, depending on conditions and where we are. So we're going to monitor that and see what we're able to do for them. Would the school play fall under that as well as a part? The, the school play, the production? Um, yeah, the, I, again, yeah. I think um, the, all of those like extracurricular activities we'd want to look at and see what we can do. But, I, but there may be some where we can manage and do almost everything virtually and, and still move it along. In some cases, you obviously can't do yeah. that. You need to have people face to face. OK, thank you. You take a vote. Any other questions? Can I just share a really happy story? And I know we're running long, but the band after the game spontaneously played their parade music and did the parade march. They were the happiest group of kids, and it was just heartwarming to see. So, as a band parent, I'm glad we were able to work with them. That's awesome. I miss not seeing them because it was on the point, and you don't get the band, right? Yeah. Yeah. Any other comments, discussion, questions? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 6.04 is a motion to approve the attached list of student organizations and officers uh, for 2020-2021 in compliance with board policy 618 uh, for student account funds. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 6.05 is a motion to approve the student attendance and application of the student discipline code for the TRIPS requests, uh, request to PIAH state championships uh, for the uh, teams listed below for field hockey and football uh, over the next couple weeks. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Again, congrats again to those teams for uh, their Whippeal championships. Um, and the last item, 6.06, uh, .06, is a motion to approve the agreement between the County of Allegheny uh, Department of Human Services and uh, Pine Richland for uh, purposes of providing transportation services to a child or children placed in an out-of-home placement located outside of the child's school district of origin. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? 
Motion carries. Thanks, Ben. Dr. Mihalik, Staff Services. Thank you, Peter. Item 7.01 is uh, personnel, a motion to approve the personnel supplemental and transportation items as attached. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 7.02 is a motion to approve the first reading of policy 103, non-discrimination in school and classroom practices as attached, and the retiring of policy 248, unlawful harassment. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? I will add here uh, that I am, we, we <laughs> revisions to Title IX compelled us to reassess these policies, to reassess our entire process. <clears throat> that is good and appropriate and required. At that time, and given the background, I said if we're going to touch these policies, we need to touch them with an eye toward diversity, equity, and inclusion. <clears throat> And there was conversation about that at our last meeting. At this point, with four members of the board, not five, not a majority, four, and that's important, engaged in the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Leadership Council, I think we can take the time to go through that process. I think policy recommendations are likely to come out. I don't know what they are yet. Uh, what I wanted to make sure was that a process was marching toward that conclusion. This will allow us to get, frankly, what is a very big lift off our plate so we can breathe a little bit and have room and time to comfortably assess other issues. We may open up this policy again. It's not going to look like this, uh, thankfully, because this is big and a little messy. So. I'm good with this and actually would really like to see it move forward and go through three readings, get off our agenda. So when it comes back, it's a different conversation as opposed to this very, very process related uh, conversation. Does that work for the board? Mm -hmm. Then let's start moving these policies through. All those in favor of the first reading? Yes. Say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 7.03 is a motion to approve the first reading of policy 124, alternative instruction methods and application as attached. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? I would say Dr. P, if he wants to talk about both this one and the next one just briefly yeah, for just, the board. Just real quick, um, 124. Uh, we reference this policy all the time, especially at the secondary level, in terms of opportunities for students to do a number of things regarding their academic um, experiences. Uh, that really the focus of the modifications here is around acceleration. And this came out of in-depth program review for gifted and or highly achieving students, really wanting to have some clear criteria for acceleration in mathematics for grades K to 6. So that specific language is now added into our administrative regulations. So we tweak the policy enough to know that there's a separation between K to 6 and 7 to 12. And then the, uh, the administrators now have very clear guidelines that they will share with the community. So that if there's a question around should my or could my child accelerate in mathematics K to 6, we'll have that clear criteria established and, um, and shared. 7 to 12, it's a bit different because um, students in order to accelerate in mathematics, science, or world language do have to take a course, but they can take that course outside of Pine Richland School District. And, um, and again, there are some expectations of, of course, passing the course outside. The course would have to be approved by an administrator, and then they have to take a, the end of course assessment um, in the course that they want to bypass. Um, a lot of times we have students that want to bypass and then go into an honors level course uh, so we, we explain that that's a possibility, but you also have to meet the criteria of the program of study. So that's all been clarified uh, through the policy, but more specifically in the administrative regulations. 
and then we do a nice job of communicating that through our website and with our counselors and at the building level with our families. So that's exciting. That's moving at, um, an in-depth program review recommendation forward, uh, really at the K to six level, and it's strength strengthening a process that was already in place at the seven to, seven to twelve letter level. Uh, Two hundred four is around attendance. There are some. I mean, they're 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 minor modifications, but of course there's there's significant impact, and that's on the. Um, um, regu regulatory changes around compulsory school age moving from it was 8 to 17 now it's 6 to 18 so that's that's a modification that is um, across again all school districts across the Commonwealth and then some language around um, um, reductions in grades there was language in, in policy and practice that if there was an ex unexcused or illegal absence uh, that could result in a failing grade for that particular day. That language has been recommended to be removed, which it has been. Um, what remains is um, the possibility of some type of reduction for an illegal or an unexcused absence for classroom level activities for that day, but it wouldn't impact every activity that occurred over the course of that particular day. And that's some, there's some teacher discretion involved with that. So um, the updates of those two policies are there. Uh, administrative regulations have been revised based upon those those modifications, uh, and again, this is uh, read number one. Thank you. With respect to 7.03, is there any discussion or questions? All those in favor, say yes. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Seven point oh four. Sorry, my screen's moved here. 7.04 is a motion to approve the first reading of policy 204, attendance as attached. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 7.05, student teachers. A motion to approve the student teachers as attached. Second. Is there any discussion? <clears throat> How would a virtual model affect student teachers? Um, obviously, these students need these for their certifications to become full teachers. Um, going to guess Carla knows a lot more about that than me but uh, I, it's just a question that came up in my head that that what happens are they still able to participate be student teachers virtually and does that does that satisfy their certifications yeah so our general approach to everything is that regardless of what happens with the model if we're adapting in some way we'll try to make other things happen as well so how exactly or in what ways is it modified we'll figure that out but the institutions need that as a part of their process mm -hmm. certainly the student teacher needs it and many hands make light work we'll find ways to engage them to help pine richland students as well and arguably it's a skill that they need going yeah. forward potentially mm -hmm. so yeah. time awesome. will spend thank you any other questions or comments all those in favor say yes yes yes, yes. yes. opposed motion carries thank you thank you Matt. Operational services, no objection, I'll just take this one. Item 8.01 is in motion to approve the 2021-2022 academic calendar as attached. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion, comments, or questions? All those in favor, say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 8.02 is public information regarding our weather closure contingency schedule. Dr. Miller? Yeah, so this would, um, again, 10 days, two weeks, these all make a difference. But we were planning this work um, prior to the, to the increase in cases and change in conditions. So uh, if we're, uh, as we're planning to move into full virtual at or before Thanksgiving, this is not relevant. Hopefully we return to hybrid and we return at some point when there's still weather related potential. And if that were to occur, we would be able to 
um, again, count that day, deliver that instruction. The way we're thinking about this, and it's worth thinking about not just for this year, but for future years, is we would have some segment of time in the morning that is sort of asynchronous, predetermined activity, some flexibility there for students and families. And then we would follow a shortened prescribed schedule that is more synchronous in nature. Um, and so in that way, we would be able to um, maintain the hours, maintain the day. We know that the days of, you know, you get the call and the call is Rachel Hathorne, something like um, this is Director of Communications, <laughs> Rachel Hathorne. It's a courtesy call from the Director of Communications. Uh, we know that that's a celebratory moment. Uh, <laughs> at the same time, you know, this year, w we, we really have to take advantage of every moment and not miss anything. So that's where we are for now. Um, and again, it would be irrelevant during a period of 100% virtual, but may become relevant again after that. We can Thank still you. have Rachel make calls of some sort. Yeah, Armstrong goes down like every other day, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Item 8.03 is a motion to approve scenario B, B as the redistricting option. Second. This scenario was outlined in our last meeting as a board and also presented in more detail along with the justification in a town hall meeting presented by Dr. Justice. Thank you. Appreciate all the work. This entire process, this is the culmination of this vote in uh, a year long process, uh, a little bit longer actually, um, in right sizing so we can offer uh, equal programs uh, to our students at all three elementaries. Any other discussion? Just it was surprising how smooth it was. I mean, when we talked redistricting, I think everyone in this room had the same, like, mm -hmm. we're going to talk redistricting. The work that was done made this go so smooth. And I think that with the way it was communicated to the community, um, kudos. Like, I don't think it could have gone smoother. Not everyone's going to be happy. But the way it was laid out, I, I don't see how you can argue it. Yeah, yeah. Doing something right uh, help can save you time in the long run. It takes a lot of work up front, though. Yep, uh, we appreciate that. There's no work that. to begin after this decision is made as well, because we're going to shepherd those students to their next place and staff members as best as possible. I think that's a testament to the process and following that process as well, and, and the people behind that. So. Agreed. All right, any other further comments? All those in favor of scenario B say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 9.01 is just a reminder under board business uh, that we have the board reorganization at our next uh, full meeting together. I know you will all be at the Academic Achievement Committee meeting, but uh, the next scheduled full board meeting on December 7th will involve re-election of officers and the reappointment of representatives to external agencies as listed. Uh, this month, I've tried to reach out to everyone, uh, as I do a few times a year, and talk about this and other topics uh, for the good of the board. At this point, I you know, haven't heard of someone who says, you really got to get me off of this board because I want to be over here or in this spot or not. But by all means, uh, feel free to reach out communicate that it helps to know in advance of the meeting if there is interest in change if you're unable to serve it helps to know if you would like to serve and you're not presently before we get to the meeting not strictly necessary but I want to throw that out there <coughs> item 10.01 reports uh, briefly on the IU I think I'd mentioned the development of a strategic planning process uh, we have begun senior leadership at the IU, <coughs> has uh, begun training. We're using a sort of train the trainer model where uh, we're bringing an outside group to 
help the IU develop the skills in even creating a strategic plan. The, an outside group was used in 2010 for the last strategic plan, and it had all the highlights and pitfalls of an outside group creating a strategic plan. Um, it looked good. Uh, the fonts were nicely aligned. There were specific actionable goals. It was awesome. I know that because there's you know 50 copies of them sitting untouched uh, in a row for you to go look at. So of course it didn't live and there wasn't a, a large embrace of it. It didn't guide the actions of the board and the leadership uh, because also it wasn't theirs. So <clears throat> we know that the best plans uh, are those that, that have a large degree of ownership uh, by the organization that is going to be implementing them. That doesn't mean the skills exist necessarily for us uh, at the IU entirely yet, but we're going to build those skills, hopefully to such an extent that we can serve as a resource to other districts in the county uh, to help them with their strategic planning processes. Uh, we know as an organization ourselves, we reference the amount of growth between our first strategic mm -hmm. plan uh, with Dr. Miller and then how that process looked so different four or five years later. So we're, we're back at that first plan, uh, but excited to be doing that work. And I think, the, uh, I think the path that's been laid out is the right path. I will also mention, and I believe I've asked the board for input on this in the past, but we will be <coughs> making a decision at our no November meeting, and it's become, again, like, uh, <laughs> like the weather days. I think it's going to be a non-issue about whether to have voting in person mm -hmm. for <coughs> the AIU board elections in March. We're required to give notice to PD. We have to vote on that in November. There was some debate, and I asked for input. There is no longer really much debate about that. It's going to be a virtual election like we had last year, I think. That's basically a fait accompli with the current conditions. PSBA delegate assembly update. I know Dr. Meyer. And Christine was on, so I don't know. Christine, go. It's, or, or, <laughs> yeah, I'm, there are two main things. Um, there was a highly supported issue, and Chris, you can help me elaborate, mm -hmm. with um, charter schools recommending that the state um, freeze any additional brick or cyber charter schools for the time being. Um, I think that had a pretty overwhelming support. Um, Ninety-nine. And, Mm -hmm. What was it? <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> and then the other one is it's dealing with what we're dealing with now, um, with you know diversity, equity, and um, inclusion, and um, you know funding, and what that looks like, and how you know how things are being funded across the state. Um, and there was pretty wide support for that as well. Um, interestingly, I told Peter on the way in. It, there's a case in front of the court right now of $4.6 billion that the state's saying is that we are underfunded as public schools, and the large majority of that is schools that are high need schools, is where they're being underfunded. Mm -hmm. um, so it all really ties together. Um, you know, Peter and I talked a little bit with, with the charter school piece. You know, funding's going to be really tight for public schools in the next couple of years. In, we want to make sure we are funding what we have and not taking monies away from schools that need it desperately right now. So if we add new you know, charters or new cybers, cyber charters, that takes money away from the schools that are desperately going to need it. Um, and the funding um, equation is you know, something that I've struggled with since moving back to Pennsylvania, um, that the inequities between our schools are so vast, um, and it's an effort um, to work together as school boards to make sure all Pennsylvania students are getting the education that they deserve. Mm -hmm. Chris, do you want to add anything to that? Um, so the only other part of the cyber charter was um, the, it was a moratorium on the creation of any new schools, but mm -hmm. then also on any uh, increase in cost or actually even, even increase in enrollment. These, and these are legislative platforms mm -hmm. that, that the PSBA is, is um, backing. And that, that both of those had very, like a 99% and a 93% uh, vote from the, from the delegates. And I, another thing I'll bring up that's kind of tangential but important for us to understand with charters and charters expanding, um, I just went to a Pens the you know, higher ed version of something in Pennsylvania. Last year, the state had 21,000 teachers retire 
teacher education programs only certified at approximately 4,500. We are going to have a teacher shortage. Now in a school district like Pine Richland, it probably won't impact us, but it will impact us in things like substitutes. And so, you know, freezing enrollment in charters and prohibiting with charters is going to help schools actually be able to get teachers, which is going to be an issue. When, when Dr. Mar, uh, we were talking about this, and, and Carla said, we are going to have a teacher shortage, and I've, we've heard that before, most of us in this room have heard that before. We were talking also about these challenges with short-term subs. We both recognize that, in fact, Pine Richland will probably always be able to find plenty of applicants for a fifth grade reading teacher. Um, it's not we are going to have a teacher shortage. This is what a teacher shortage looks like in Pine Richland. We can fill our fifth grade reading spots. We can't get short-term subs. That's what it'll look like in Pine Richland. We'll be able to fill those sp spots, but you know that may be what it looks like for us. It's not in the future, it's now, right? Those problems are impacting, and the, the, the problems we see throughout the region about short-term subs are, are typically, when did they graduate from school? The past five to 10 years, right? What are the number of graduates? Boom. What That's would happened. you expect to see? And we're seeing it. So it's not a, um, this is going to happen. <clears throat> it's this is happening, I think. It, it changed my perspective a bit, so I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And the subs matter for, not just for when teachers are sick, but as well as for planning and, and for professional development mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, the in-depth program review. And I mean, it touches the curriculum and it, it really gets its fingers in everywhere, so. Mm -hmm. There's good. There, there are connections there. I think the connections. I, I would. I would go a little bit further on the on the fair funding. Mm -hmm. So it's the idea that um, we and and the controversy at PSBA, right? The the debate among districts who send delegates mm -hmm. is the fair funding formula definitely would, depending on how it's implemented and how PSB advocates, it could potentially take state funds away from districts like Pine Richland in favor of traditionally underserved communities. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a connection, D and I, and I'll, I'll, I'll make it here, you know, uh, for people to consider about how policies that we have and issues that we advocate for may have connections to these things. The, the very fact that there are wealthy large white school districts in our outer rings not just in allegheny county but in bucks in philadelphia mm -hmm. montgomery county Th that outcome is itself likely the outcome of racist policies that existed before we were born <clears throat> racist policies with respect to federally subsidized mortgages federally subsidized education the gi bill Right? So specific decisions were made. And then ring fencing that. Then saying, well, we don't want to be, right? So we have Pittsburgh schools and you have Allegheny County, but we can be very separate. And those decisions to be separate uh, were made specifically and largely by white politicians uh, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. We inherit those structures. Mm -hmm. So you may not be racist. I may not be racist, but we've inherited a lot of racist baggage. And so that's what I think it means. I think it's a good, a good point to illustrate because we can take umbrage and defensiveness at saying, I don't see racism, I don't see color, I don't, you know, and that all may be true. And yet we sit here atop a pinnacle, if you will, that was built somewhat on racist structures. That can be hard to see, can take years to see, and I, I want to make sure that we are embarking on that sort of introspection as we go through this process. And so, to talk about a fair funding formula mm -hmm. that addresses that, or redresses that, touches on diversity, equity, inclusion, and efforts to be anti-racist. I just want to say thank you for saying the hard part out loud. <laughs> and 
one of the one of the points that was made as this was being um, briefly discussed was um, that they were asking for more money not just to say we're satisfied with the same amount of money that we have and now we're going to just shift it around they're also advocating for increased uh, funding from the state to be to be a to be allocated using the fair funding formula. Correct. Right. Correct. Right. Yeah. Any other reports? I'll just say that uh, Pine Township again. I'm I'm just going to talk about Parks and Rec again. But um, you know, in light of everything, everyone's gone over and above those folks have continued to try to reach out and be able to do things for the community obviously it hasn't gone the way they wanted to this year but they had uh, a great trunk or treat um, very successful and holiday dazzle is not going to happen this year but it's going to be the holly jolly uh <laughs> i just had at the tip of my tongue um the holly jolly party which will be like a trunk or treat but for christmas um apparently santa's going to be in a bubble uh, which, uh, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. Um, what's that? S snow globe. Yeah, well, I, they didn't call it a snow globe. He's going to be in a bubble. Um, we're, we're, we're picturing one of those things where you can, you know, run around and bump into each other, but, um, they're going to have 11 or 12 stations and it's going to be like a trunk or treat for kids. You sign up online virtually, uh, the same way that you did before. It's going to be limited, uh, number of people per, uh, uh, time section. But again, they're doing just a great job to continue to reach out to the community. It's a great thing for the kids, especially, um, and I'm sure the adults love it too because the you know the kids are um, bouncing off walls at home. We're going to go into it looks like somewhat of a shutdown again, so it's going to be a great opportunity for the kids to see Santa. Not in the same way we always would. I hate the the, the term new normal, but it's one of those things that's caught up in it. And I just applaud them for continuing to put those uh, uh, programs out there. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, they did a nice job on their, um, whatever you would call it, their, their, uh, the booklet that was mailed out to the community members it was a really nice job, very well done. Doesn't rival Pine Richlands, but um, no, it, it, the, the, the information and how it's presented, the photo, it was all very, it made me want to read it, which I did. Um, found it very interesting. Any others? Ms. Williams, do we have any visitors who'd like to be recognized? We do not. Awesome. I know this was a long meeting. I appreciate your engagement. And if board members and administrators could stick around for an executive session after this meeting, we will discuss a student matter, safety matter, and a real estate matter. Good night, everyone. Thank you.